former assistant gave me, uh, Cherish the Journey. Um, and I thought that that was a really appropriate uh, quote for not only Helen Frankenthaler, who I feel did that in leaps and bounds, but also for my colleague, Elizabeth Smith and, um, and her work in the art world. So, um, uh, so grab a cup of coffee, um, relax, settle in. Um, Elizabeth and I are gonna first have a conversation, but we are hoping for a conversation with all of you. This is coffee and chat, coffee and culture, and we're wanting to have a dialogue this morning uh, to get our Friday started and get our weekend started. And uh, what better way to do that than thinking about Helen Frankenthaler with my colleague, Elizabeth Smith. So Elizabeth, could you raise your hand? And are you unmuted? Let's see, yes, I, I think, think I you are unmuted. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Elizabeth, I'll introduce you to the community. I'm sure many of us know um, Elizabeth already. Elizabeth has been the executive director of the Helen Frankenthaler Foundation since its uh, uh, founding in 2013. Um, uh, Frankenthaler passed away in, I believe it was 2011, and the foundation was started and up and running in 2013. Um, Elizabeth's had a career in museum curating and leading institutions prior to her joining the foundation community. She was the um, uh, executive director and curatorial affairs at the Art Gallery uh, of Ontario in Toronto, the chief curator and deputy director for programs at Chicago's Museum of Contemporary Art, the MCA in Chicago, and curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. And throughout Elizabeth's career as a scholar and curator, she's worked uh, on several projects with artists who have a relationship to PAFA in our collection and exhibition history. Uh, beyond her scholarship on Frankenthaler, which is bringing us all together this morning, she's also done a, an unforgettable project on Lee Bontecu, um, Jenny Holzer, uh, Carrie James Marshall, Donald Moffat, Catherine Opie, and Cindy Sherman, to name just a few. She's published widely on contemporary art and architecture. She's taught at Columbia and Barnard Colleges and is currently an adjunct professor at one of my alma maters, Bennington College, um, uh, where she's working with the museum studies uh, students and department at, in Vermont. She's also taught at Southern California School of Fine Arts and the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, a peer institution of PAFA. So please everyone, let's um, say hello and good morning to Elizabeth. Glad you're here. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Brooke. Um, thank you for that nice introduction. I, should, I also wanna correct one thing you said, which is that I studied at Barnard and Columbia. I didn't teach there. So oh, okay. <laughs> I just, just wanna like go on the record for that. Thank you. Especially because we're recording too, and this is all right. going to up on YouTube. So apologies, um, no, duly noted. Um, so Elizabeth, we have a great crowd this morning, and I'm sure that has everything to do with Helen Frankenthaler. So we thought we would start the morning and the talk with um, framing the artist. Uh, we wanted to make sure we're all grounded in the same place. Uh, so we're. Uh, We've asked Elizabeth to talk a little bit about the artist. Then we're gonna talk about the foundation and its collaboration with PAFA. And Ruth, I'm hoping if you're up for it, maybe I could tease you into the conversation at that point. And then um, uh, we are gonna talk about how the foundation is dealing with the, this time of a pandemic and playing an important role in the art world. And along the lines, we'd love to open this conversation up to all of you. Um, uh, so as Abby said, we'll be looking for hands raised and, um, uh, and look forward to having this conversation with you. So Elizabeth, I'm gonna share the screen and show uh, a couple images of uh, Frankenthaler in Papa's permanent collection if you wanna share a little bit about the artist. Great, okay. Uh, well, I imagine everybody who's here on the call knows something about Helen Frankenthaler, but to, to frame the conversation, uh, let me just say a few words about, you know, who she was, why she's important, why I'm thrilled to be dedicating my professional life 
going forward um, and during the past six years to stewarding her legacy through the foundation. So Frankenthaler is one of the most significant artists of the mid to late 20th century, known for both her abstract painting and her printmaking, primarily, um, as well as you know, bodies of work on paper and some work in other mediums. But it's really her painting and her printmaking that distinguishes her. She came of age in the early 50s. She was particularly influenced by the work of Jackson Pollock. And she took from his innovations some innovations of her own. And as a very young artist, she, just started, she started to develop a technique which became known as the soak stain technique of thinning painting so she could pour it and manipulate it over the surface of a canvas to produce you know, really sort of glorious and sort of un, uh, unforeseen um, effects with abstract painting. She influenced other artists. She's known as the um, sort of progenitor of a movement that became known as color field painting. Uh, artists like Morris Lewis and Kenneth Noland were, were more sort of squarely positioned as color field painters. Um, and Frankenthaler, through her six decade career, through a lengthy career, it continued to experiment with the parameters of abstraction that she set up for herself. So one thing I like about her work is that from decade to decade, the paintings look different. And even from painting to painting, they look different. Uh, I think that the work on the screen right now that Brooke has pulled up, Walnut Hedge, is a great example of her work of pretty much mid-career. This was painted in the 70s. Frankenthaler had a good two decades of work behind her already and would continue working for you know, at least a couple decades more. Uh, and you can see it. it, it's a beautiful example of her soak stain technique, thinned paint poured into the surface of a canvas. Some areas are thinly painted, others are, are, are thicker. There's an interplay of line, form, color. There's a sense of aliveness and a sense of a kind of like a living, breathing organism that comes out of Frankenthaler's paintings. And her use of color is also extremely distinctive. And I think you see that in, in Walnut Hedge, sort of unexpected and a bit muted in, in the case of this particular painting. Um, it's, a, it's a tremendous example. Um, as a printmaker, Frankenthaler became really highly regarded as one of the um, sort of foremost innovators in printmaking and for her work being very complex. And I know that you know, Ruth and, and others are gonna comment on that more, but I'll just say that um, she's you know, really regarded as somebody who set you know, a very high bar in printmaking, who brought together numerous techniques, sometimes in a single print, and made a body of work that was highly complex and interesting. And the last thing I'll say about Frankenthaler, I think it doesn't, it's, doesn't need to be said, but I wanna say it. Um, she was one of the few women artists of her generation who achieved major recognition during her lifetime. So I think that's, you know, I think it's worth pointing out still, even though I think we all know that. Yeah, I think that's one reason why we have such a nice community gathered this morning. Um, thank you uh, so much, Elizabeth. Um, there, uh, let's move to the collaboration that um, uh, between the foundation, oops, let me go here, between the foundation and PAFA. And uh, last year, we had the great honor of being um, one of several university museums receiving a gift from the Helen Frankenthaler Foundation of 17 prints. And uh, it was such an exciting addition to our collection. We did have, of course, Walnut Hedge, the painting that Elizabeth just spoke of um, in our permanent collection. We also had two other prints in the permanent collection, but to receive 17, it obviously solidifies her contributions to American art in PAFA's story. Uh, so we're just elated. It gave us the opportunity to put together this exhibition at one stroke, prints by Helen Frankenthaler. Uh, this project was a collaboration between the museum and our public education department, specifically the Youth Council, a, a wonderful group of future colleagues, the future curators and museum directors of the world, who um, uh, had the opportunity to curate an exhibition at PAFA for the museum, uh, their first curation, guided ably by my colleagues in, um, in public education. 
And I was looking last night again at the wall text of this exhibition, which I think we all understand is currently closed to the public during our pandemic. Uh, the exhibition was supposed to have closed two weeks ago if all things had been normal. Um, we are hoping, like most museums, to reopen to the public this summer. And our, our plan, therefore, is to extend this exhibition so that you all can come into the galleries in person, um, practicing social distancing and all of that, and see this uh, beautiful gift to PAFA's permanent collection. Uh, the gift included 17 works and the students um, entitled the show At One Stroke, inspired by a wonderful Frankenthaler quote. She said at one time, a picture that is beautiful or that comes off or that works looks as if it were made of one stroke. And uh, I think that points to her experimentation, Elizabeth. And I wondered if you could say a little bit about the gifts to university museums and how the foundation arrived at that decision. Well, since we've been active as an organization, <clears throat> sorry, <coughs> excuse me. Hmm. I hate to do that on screen. <coughs> oh, okay, so after receiving our bequest from the artist's estate, when the foundation became active, our mission is educational and philanthropic, uh, but Frankenthaler left us a really broad and open mandate as to how we would accomplish that. So it's been our pleasure to, in honor, to try to figure out ways to best do that, given our holdings of Frankenthaler's work, given um, some, of the, um, some of the things that we have to work with, including her research materials um, through our, in our archives, and, and um, also, um, but as she was a successful artist in her lifetime, um, her financial assets. But initially, we began a focus on education and educational institutions, first and foremost with Bennington College, because that was Frankenthaler's alma mater. She supported them throughout her lifetime. And so the foundation has continued that support and involvement with Bennington. But as time went on, we wanted to do more with um, other institutions of higher education. So we began a scholarships program for MFA and PhD students at a number of universities around the United States. And we also thought about um, what we could do with Helen's uh, body of work and to start to make some gifts. We began with the prints. There's a voluminous body of print work that, that Helen made. And we felt that to start giving, making gifts of groups of prints together with grants to museums so that they could you know, utilize the prints for their own um, you know, artistic and educational objectives would be the way to go. So we enlisted the expertise of Ruth Fine, um, who's a major, major scholar and expert on Helen's prints to work with us and advise us on how to shape the Frankenthaler Prints Initiative for university affiliated museums. So I, I don't know whether Ruth wants to wants to speak up at this time and tell us more about that. Ruth, um, mm -hmm. I'm gonna, I think you're unmuted. Are you unmuted, Ruth? Yeah, I just saw I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Lovely. So Ruth, before we all closed due, the, due to the pandemic, we had several opportunities to um, invite you to PAFA and share this gift. Could you share a little bit about your process with this group this morning? Sure. Um, the idea of the gifts were to arrive at um, a group of 10 prints for each of the 10 um, university collections. And the attempt then was to give an overview of the prints both uh, chronologically, starting as early as we could start and ending as late as we could end, and to give as many technical elements of the prints uh, so that m the group, I think every group still was able to have etchings and lithographs and woodcuts. Um, and then to give a group of proofs for one of the 10 prints. So this is the group of proofs that PAFA received. And the number of proofs varied so that PAFA got 17 prints. Some groups may have gotten 20, some may have gotten 15. Uh, that would give an idea of uh, Frankenthaler's working process. She was 
amazingly experimental and open in her approach to printmaking more than most artists. And she used her proofs in many ways. In some cases, she used them as a way to develop an image. In some cases, she used them as a way to think about varying possibilities of an image that might have come back later. And so each of the 10 gifts is quite different from the others because of the proofs, but quite similar to the other in the range of what they cover. And they also each cover um, a diversity of workshops. So the first workshop she worked with primarily was Universal Limited Art Editions, ULAE. And she did a huge body of work with them. She did a huge body of work with Tyler Graphics later, but she also worked with uh, Paste Prints and Crown Point Press and various other printmaking, publishing workshops throughout the world. So it's a kind of international representation of printmaking as well as the representation of Helen's as broadly as, as we could make it. Uh, it's an amazing project for me, of course, because the work is so beautiful that you just stay fascinated and enthralled looking at all these things. So I think that's it, unless anyone has questions. I totally agree with you, Ruth. Uh, what a privilege. I, I have a question. Um, Elizabeth was pointing out this important painting that's in Paffa's collection. I'm showing it in the PowerPoint now, Walnut Hedge. And I wondered, Ruth, if your decision to include these two works as part of the gift from the foundation to Paffa were uh, in dialogue with the painting and your thought process or is it a happy accident that they seem to me at least to be aesthetically related? Uh, it's probably a little bit of each. When I got started, I was aware of what was in any collections and tried to connect with that. Um, but it also was what was possible um, when it was possible to have things that made relationships make sense than I did and otherwise not. And one, one thing to point out also is that um, we, we thought first about museums that either had no examples of Helen's prints already in their collection, even though, you know, the collecting of prints and their use as, you know, educational and artistic vehicles was important in the museum, or um, places that maybe just had one or two examples. And I think in Papa's case, you already had, I think, one other print? That's right. It was one other print. Mm -hmm. right. Right, so we were looking to, you know, sort of build up those holdings. And also museums where, universities where printmaking played an important role, um, which is not always the case, so that we knew they would have an enhanced role right at the outset. And that's certainly part of PAPA's history is our, uh, the importance of printmaking at our art school and how um, printmaking is, been, is also a large part of the museum's collection. And we, um, we, got, we got cut short a little bit with our season of printmaking because we had started a season of printmaking at the beginning of the calendar year that was to go into the spring. But we did have a, several weeks to um, implement some programming and share our season of printmaking with the public. Right, and another thing was important was that they be across the country so that a gift went to California and gifts went to the Southwest and gifts went to the Southeast and the Northeast. So that was important as well. Yep. Yeah, it's an amazing, it was an amazing project that you both um, led and we couldn't be happier to be a part of that project. I'm gonna stop the PowerPoint for a moment, bring us back to the Brady Bunch grid um, where I can also see if anybody wants to participate in the conversation. Um, if, uh, Elizabeth, something else that we had wanted to talk about was uh, the foundation's work right now uh, during um, this pandemic. And this is obviously an unexpected uh, uh, crisis, uh, a global crisis, and your foundation really stepped up very quickly uh, in support of the art sector. And I know everyone on this call would love to hear about what you guys, you are doing with your board of trustees. Yeah, thank you. Um, I should also say that um, we're not alone in stepping up. A lot of the other artist endowed foundations and, and, and other 
other types of foundations have, have done that as well. And I think it's, you know, we, we, we're actually able to move quickly on things given our structures, which is a, a really wonderful thing. When, so our, our decision process went as follows. When, you know, we all, you know, were sort of hit with the impact of this pandemic and we saw what was happening, not just to organizations, but, you know, to individuals, to artists and such. We began to, you know, ask ourselves, what can we do? And we were quickly approached by some organizations that were coming together to set up funds specifically to help artists. Our foundation is prohibited from making grants directly to individuals. We can only make, you know, grants to organizations. So we were pretty quickly convinced that it was, you know, that it was right to say yes to these, these specific organizations. We had to stop and take about two weeks to figure out where we were financially. You know, what was our capacity? What things would, could we not do this year? What things would we delay, postpone, or even just, you know, cancel? And how could we pivot quickly to address this need? My board was great in, you know, just immediately saying, you know, let's do this and let's not just do it as a one shot deal, but let's establish a multi year um, initiative so that, you know, we'll, we can continue to give funds, not just this year, but in, you know, 2021, 2022, assuming that the impact will be long lasting. Um, I, should I mention the organizations that we gave to? Because I think people may want to know if you're interested. If you haven't heard about these already, you might want to check them out if you're interested. Um, the Foundation for Contemporary Arts established a COVID-19 emergency relief fund that gives direct grants to artists. And also an organization was formed called Artists Relief, Artist Relief, singular, um, that gives additional grants to artists, not just visual artists, but also to dancers, you know, writers, uh, musicians, etc. And then just this past week, we participated in an effort to provide emergency funds to art workers. Um, it's called the Tri-State Relief Fund for non-salaried workers in the visual arts. So these, this would be freelancers, you know, the art handlers, the, the contract registrars, the people that work, you know, sort of in the gig economy that don't, that weren't collecting a salary, but were working from project to project. So those are three initiatives that, you know, people can apply to directly at the source, not with us, but at, you know, at the, the entities to which we gave funds. And Abby is posting the links in our chat section of this Zoom uh, meeting. So you can find those links uh, at any time because I know we have artists on this uh, call. I know we also have colleagues uh, in the gig economy on this call. Please uh, investigate, share for, with your friends and your family and, and please apply. Um, uh, it's amazing the generosity and the support that's been uh, showing up um, throughout the art sector. Now, Elizabeth, we heard before we started the meeting that we might be joined by Anthony Kirk. And I am wondering if Anthony Kirk uh, is on the call. I'm doing a quick scroll. And if he is, if he might want to um, join the conversation, I'm not seeing that he's here yet. Uh, but if Anthony is on the call, we understand that you worked with Frankenthaler uh, at Tyler Graphics. And um, if you join us, we'd love you to share with our community what that experience. Oh, there he is. Um, Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Terrific. Hi, Anthony. Hello. This um, is my first Zoom conference. I'm very interested. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> where a lot of us are novices to Zoom, so <laughs> welcome aboard. Can you uh, hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you, I think, very well. And um, uh, we can't see you. We can't see you, but that's okay. That's uh, that that's a choice. Uh, how do, how do you, I, how, what did I do so you can see me? So at the bottom of your screen, you'll see an icon that says "Unstop Video," and if you click on that video, the, the little camera. Um, oh. There you are. Well, there I am. Hi. Ow. Okay. So Elizabeth, uh, what a pleasure for us because um, uh, uh, Anthony, we heard you were being joined at the invitation of Arlene 
Um, we understand that you had the privilege of working with Frankenthaler at Tyler Graphics, uh, and um, we'd love you to share your experience with all of us. Well, um, there was one interesting story when the Newburgh Museum had an exhibition of her paintings. And um, for the friends of the Newburgh Museum, they had a tour of Tyler Graphics to see the current prints by Frankenthal that are in progress. And as the tour ended, there were some pull-out screens that had large monotypes. And this woman said to me, she looked at the price of the monotype and the size and said, why does Frankenthal do monotypes? Because if she did a painting this size, it would go for 10 times as much money. So I thought quickly on my feet. And um, I explained to the woman why she does it. The following Monday, I'm working with Helen. And she said, how did the tour go? And I told her the story. She said, what did you say? I said, well, for artists of her generation, working alone in the studio, any marks she makes on the canvas are hers. No one else is in the studio. But when she makes a print for the monotype, there's not someone else, there's something else, and it's the press. And I said, when artists layer colors over each other in a monotype, when it goes through the press, all those colors get squished and squeezed. And that's why artists really like to do monotype because it is, um, the, the press is like an interloper in the, in the process. And for her, an artist of her generation, that accident was, was what was wanted, you know? And um, that's why artists do monotypes. And uh, Helen said to me, good answer. <laughs> so that was good. But there's also a very un another kind of interesting story working with Helen. Back in the 1970s, there was an artist called Armin Landek, who was in his 80s in rural Connecticut. And he was one of the regionalist artists and he made etchings and engravings that at that time, no one was buying art. And uh, he limited his editions to 100. So when his work began to sell in the seventies, his grandson came to Robert Blackburn's printmaking workshop looking for a printer who could print his grandfather's prints. So I did some and I did some more. And then Armin Landek invited me to the country in Connecticut to visit him. And while we were having lunch, he said to me, you know, I used to teach at the Brearley School in the 1930s and one of my students was a little girl called Helen Frankenthaler. And she did very well in the art world. Well, I kept that little bit of information in my head for about 15 years. Now I'm working with Helen. And one day she's by the sink, washing her hands, bent over. And I said, Helen, I used to print for an artist who would you teach at the Brearley School in the 30s, Armin Landek. And Helen stood up straight and said, Mr. Landek? Oh, he was such a tall, handsome man. But surely he must be dead now. I said, well, he died 15 years ago. She said, I always sent him invitations to my exhibitions and he always came. Oh, wow. So I printed for two artists, generations apart. <laughs> it's quite interesting. <laughs> but working with her, um, sometimes there's one point when I was doing a, helping her do a split by Aquitant. And then I was back in the acid room and some acid spilled on the plate a little bit, right? And um, then I showed her the proofs and when Helen was working, we had to, and she wanted yellows, we had to steel face the plates and then proof them and show them to her because the yellow would print better in a steel face plate rather than a copper plate. And then she would add some more work. Well, I accidentally spilled a little bit of acid on the edge of the plate and it printed and I pointed to her and I said, Helen, that was some mistake I made and I can erase that off the plate. And she said, no, I like it. And, um, and quite often, there was one time she would look at the print and she turned to me and said, what do you think? Well, when you work with an artist, sometimes they'll open a window or a door to let you get involved, right? Otherwise you stand off and stay back, right? But I had to think very fast on my feet. And, and speak to this artist in a very intelligent way. 
And uh, going back to your, what you're saying about her being one of the few women artists of a generation to make it. When I worked with her on a portfolio, this is not a book. Ken Tyler set the frontispiece of the portfolio, Helen Frankenthaler. And when Helen saw it, she says, no, it's going to be just Frankenthaler. It's Motherwell, it's Pollock, it's Rauschenberg, it's Frankenthaler. Wow. That was her statement. And I, and I worked with Ruth doing some monotypes at the Center for Contemporary Printmaking, where Helen would send her husband, daughter, uh, son-in-laws, uh, and Ruth came one day to make some monotypes at the center. And I remember that day very well. So. Thank you so um, much. Um, I think I'm so, we've got, we got on very well. Thank you. Elizabeth, I'm, uh, do you have any questions for Anthony? Or I mean, that's wonderful to think of the mat, the the title of the book, Frankenthaler. Yes, yes, that's it's so interesting to hear, and also your story about her response to accident. You know, it's something happening by accident. Yeah. I think in her practice, she she often embraced accident, and that was part of what made, as she liked to call it, the magic of yes. a picture. You know, whether it was a painting or a print or, you know, any kind of artwork she made. So that's wonderful to hear. And one, and one other thing she said to me, she said, it's all in my wrist. You know, some artists work from the shoulder and the arm length. She said, it's the, my wrist hmm. that's making the marks. Not so much her hand, but her wrist. I always remember that. You know, the idea of accidents and experimentation make me think, Lynn, of your project at Arthur Ross Gallery. And um, uh, this must resonate with you as well, the idea of a mistake and experimentation. When I think of the exhibition that you just posted on uh, her works on paper, what, are you, what, what is this conversation making you think back to with that project uh, on the other side of the Schuylkill River here in Philadelphia? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if I can unmute here. Oh, I just did. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Hi. Well, it's been a, a, more than an, a happy accident. It's been really a wonderful process for me to work with Elizabeth and all of the found, all of the staff of the foundation for about the last year and a half. My, I, um, when I was the senior curator at PAFA, we actually purchased Walnut Creek. So that was a great thing for me actually, because I had long admired Helen's work. And um, so that was a great thing in terms of my curatorial history. And also we, um, we awarded Helen the, the, I think it's called the President's Award. It was in honor of the 200th anniversary. Yep. And actually Derek Gilman revived that award and we awarded it to Helen Frankenthaler in 2005, uh, Louise Bourgeois and also um, Alex Katz. So, but to go back to the, the show, I was very interested in her works on paper because it's an area of Helen's work that I was not very familiar with, but I was fascinated by. And I was also fascinated by the fact that she had been doing it over the decades. It wasn't something that she began later in her uh, professional career. So I was interested in looking at that and looking at the relationships, if you will, the happy accidents of those relationships between the works on paper and the prints. Yeah. And I was very fortunate to be able to go and work with the foundation and begin to think about the whole process. And it's funny that you mentioned this, Brooke, because uh, one of the things that, of course, our exhibition ended uh, at the end of March, but one of the ways that we've been doing online programming is to do two very, very short pieces and a video about the installation. I think the video is on our Facebook page and our YouTube um, and our Instagram. We have just posted a lecture by Angelica Mayer on Helen and um, other contemporary artists of the time. But we are now working with the foundation to sort of just finish up the process. And my intern's been doing these. 
So we'll have like a five minute art matters about first about three of the works on paper and then the one that was completed today, but still has to go through some approvals um, was on three different prints in the exhibition. So that's been a way for us to continue the project. And of course, Brooke, as you know, we did some wonderful collaborations yeah. and partnerships with you. I came and spoke and the Youth Council came and spoke, which was terrific. Yeah, uh, I think that's an amazing program that you have. So um, I've just been thrilled with um, and honored to be able to honor Helen. And of course, we had Ruth speak at the opening. So that's that's, you know, I, I feel very honored to be working on this project. And Lynn, because we have some folks on the Zoom call who aren't uh, Philly based, I'd love you to mention your catalog because I'm sure I, I assume there still might be copies available. Right. As a matter of fact, Anthony, <laughs> you send me your, your email. Here's the catalog. <laughs> but uh, the, there are some catalogs still available. So some of us, um, I, can, I can give Abby. Abby, I don't know if you have my email address, but if you email me at lmatlas at upenn.edu, I'm happy to... Um, uh, be in touch about the catalog. And so. Lynn, could you uh, let everyone on the call know where you are and where you're located in Arthur Ross Gallery? Not everybody's familiar with um, your institution. Absolutely. I'm getting a few uh, messages for that. Where is that anyway? Yeah. <laughs> so the Arthur Ross Gallery is a Kunsthalle, just like the ICA at the University of Pennsylvania. We're both at the University of Pennsylvania. We are actually housed in a Frank Furness building, um, the original library of Penn. And um, we have a website and you can find more information about us, but we are a very vibrant and active part of the University of Pennsylvania uh, in terms of the art and culture at Penn. Many of you may know the Penn Museum, you may know the ICA, we are the third leg of the tripod here in terms of the, the visual arts. And we do a, um, we do a very wide, we have a very broad mission and we do everything from ancient to contemporary. So. Thank you, Lynn. From our standpoint at the Frank Dollar Foundation, it was a wonderful coincidence really that these yes. two projects took place at the same time or that they overlapped. Um, and it's, it, it's been wonderful to see the interest in Philadelphia and the focus on Frankenthaler during, you know, the early months of this year. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the Philadelphia cultural community is very good at grabbing a moment and working collectively to celebrate artists and celebrate art making. Um, I see that again and again. It's, it's an exciting part of uh, many of you are on this call and it's one of the rewards of working in Philadelphia. Does anybody have any questions for Elizabeth or uh, um, um, Anthony? I'm going to volunteer you too for uh, if there's any questions from anyone else in the chat. We have a few more minutes. I see there's a few messages. Um, um, I, I'll just add that Frank and Thaler spoke at Penn in the early 60s. That was where I first met her. There was a Monday afternoon artist seminar for graduate students. And, and Frank how many people were in the audience? It was just a few of you, right? Like 10 of you? At the seminar? Yeah. Um, at the most, I suppose. And we just all sat around a table and Frank and Fuller was one of the speakers. And so stayed with us, probably in the Arthur Ross, um, in, the, in the Furness building. Wow. That, that was when the original ICA opened up, which was also in the Furness building. Not everyone's old enough to remember all that, but I am. <laughs> <laughs> Abby, I don't, um, I'm wondering if you see anybody with any questions. I think I'm not seeing any hands up, but I'm not always greatly skilled in that department. We don't, and we do just have about a minute. So um, okay. yeah, if you, if you do have a question, if you click on the participant button, um, we'll be able to see from there, it says raise hands, or if you want to just go like this, I will try to keep an eye out. I know technology can be annoying, but 
I will say this has been wonderful. It's so nice to have such a wealth of knowledge on Frankenthaler on Frankenthaler on this call. So from both of you and and Lynn and everyone and Ruth. Um, Elizabeth, I'd like to give you the closing time. If there's anything about Frankenthaler or their foundation or a question you want to ask Anthony, since I know that we were both so thrilled uh, by your joining us, Anthony, a nice surprise. Nice to meet you. Um, or for Ruth or Lynn or anyone on the call. We have so many Frankenthaler experts here and people who actually knew her. That's just remarkable. I have a question. Yes. Okay. Um, just just came to me. I'm sorry. And where was her uh, base physically? Uh, what city or et cetera, et cetera? Oh, well, Frank Dollar was born and raised and lived most of her life, lived and worked most of her life out of New York City. But she did also reside in Connecticut for, you know, some of the later years of her life. And she spent summers working in, in various locations, including Provincetown, Massachusetts, during the 60s. But I would say she was a New Yorker, first and foremost. Okay. Thank you. And we have a question from Lisa. I'm going to unmute you, Lisa. Lisa, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So the woods that the wood that the woodcuts were done on, are they still around or destroyed or? Because hmm. sometimes the wood, when woodcuts are, the wood is really a beautiful part of it all. Uh, Ruth, do you want to address that question? Oh, oh Ruth is muted. Hold on, Ruth. Hold My head is better than I. Summer. Some are around, some aren't around. Some were reused. Uh, a, a lot of her printing elements, uh, whether they were woodcut or etching or lithography, were used in multiple prints. And so they varied and changed and got reused. Um, but some of the wood blocks are still around. And Ruth, where, uh, do you, where are they in a museum collection or are they in private collections? Uh the ones I know of are with the foundation. I right. don't know that I, I'm not there may be some in a couple museum collections, but yeah. I'm not certain about that, actually. Sure. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. I don't know about you, you Ashley, but I really we'll think some that, research on that. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say. We, we have to do some research on that. And Abby, what I'm feeling is that there could be a part two to this conversation, particularly with our participants and everybody who's joined us this morning. Um, obviously, there's so much more that we can say about an artist like Helen Frankenthaler. Um, perhaps it would be nice to close with um, a shout out to the um, Frankenthaler Foundation who have houses the archive for um, her legacy in um, uh, the Chelsea neighborhood of New York City. Um, and um, uh, the archive was made available to the Youth Council at PAFA. So I'm sure that should you want to do research on Frankenthaler one day, any one of you on the Zoom call, please do reach out to the foundation when it reopens uh, after this COVID-19 curve. And then you can always come to PAFA and see um, the prints that were a gift from the Frankenthaler Foundation, as well as some other works that we had, thanks to Lynn and her legacy when she was a colleague at PAFA. I can't thank all of you enough. I hope you'll join us again for Culture and Coffee uh, next Friday at 1030. Um, it's just really great to see all your faces and have this conversation. Thank you, Elizabeth, Lynn, Ruth, Anthony, Mom. Good to see everybody. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation to take part here today. Yeah, it was great. Bye, all. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye, Anthony. Bye, Tony. Anthony, be in touch. <laughs> Abby, that was fun. Yeah, that was great. I don't know if we're muted. I think we're still on here. Oh, yes.